Good morning, everyone. I'm Katie Cartman, the Director of Religious Education here at Emerson Unitarian Universalist Church in Houston, Texas. Our beloved community of faith, reason, and affection welcomes all to grow in mind and spirit as together we build a better world. If you are joining us for the first time this morning, we extend a special welcome and invite you to fill out our online visitor card so you can receive more information about Emerson and our activities. Again, welcome to all. Today, we are so glad to welcome our interim minister, the Reverend Michelle Legrave, back to the pulpit. And to double our excitement, we're also welcoming our incoming music director, Julia Morsher, today. Julia has been a part of our choir for several years, and we look forward to making beautiful music together. Reverend Michelle and Julia are joined by me and Emersonian Jill Rose on the tech deck today. You'll notice that we've muted you. This helps all of us to hear the service better and we encourage you to use the chat box. Following the worship service, we'll have coffee hour time, a chance for you to gather in smaller groups to discuss the service and what's going on in your lives. Reverend Michelle. Good morning, everyone. I am so excited to be back with you for another church year and another year of ministry. Some of you have already been asking about my summer, and so I promised that you would hear more about it this morning. So while I considered calling this morning's message what I did on my summer vacation to evoke a bit of school days nostalgia, the theme is really about pilgrimage, which in all seriousness is what I actually did on leave this summer. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, wherever you find yourself on your life's journey, whichever your pronouns, whether you've walked in or rolled in or dialed in, whomever you love, you are welcome here. Come you, whoever you are, Come, you wanderer. Come, you worshiper. Come, you lover of leaving. Come, you keeper of vows. Come, you breaker of vows. Come, you wherever you've been. Come, you wherever you're going. Come, you. Let us worship together. Every Sunday, Unitarian Universalists around the country and around the world light a chalice. If you have one at home, we invite you to light yours as together we say these words. We kindle a flame we trust will lead us forward as we travel in unknown lands, where the question, shall I ever get there, resounds a clear, pure note in every silence. And now join us in singing our opening hymn, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. It's number 188 in the Gray Hymnal.
Our story today is The Treasure by Yuri Shulovitz. There once was a man and his name was Isaac. He lived in such poverty that again and again he went to bed hungry. One night he had a dream. In his dream, a voice told him to go to the capital city and look for a treasure under the bridge by the royal palace. It is only a dream, he thought when he woke up, and he paid no attention to it. The dream came back a second time, and Isaac still paid no attention to it. When the dream came back a third time, he said, maybe it's true. And so he set out on his journey. Now and then someone gave him a ride, but most of the way he walked. He walked through forests, he crossed over mountains. Finally, he reached the capital city. But when he came to the bridge by the royal palace, he found that it was guarded day and night. He did not dare to search for treasure, yet he returned to the bridge every morning and wandered around it until dark. One day, the captain of the guards asked, why are you here? Isaac told him the dream. The captain laughed. You poor fellow, he said. What a pity you wore your shoes out for a dream. Listen, if I believed a dream I once had, I would go right now to the city you came from, and I'd look for a treasure under the stove in the house of a fellow named Isaac. And he laughed again. Isaac bowed to the captain and started on his long way home. He crossed over mountains. He walked through forests. Now and then someone gave him a ride, but most of the way he walked. At le last, he reached his own town. When he got home, he dug under his stove and oh, there he found treasure. In Thanksgiving, he built a house of prayer and in one of its corners, he put an inscription. Sometimes one must travel far to discover what is near. Isaac sent the captain of the guards a priceless ruby, and for the rest of his days, Isaac lived in contentment and was never poor again. Giving out of, one of what is our own is a transforma transformative act as a community of faith, we collect an offering, not for ourselves or our congregation, but to get, give to others as a collection at collective action of our community and as a way to live out our shared values. Please give with a generous heart to support the August Share the Plate recipients, Rebuilding Together Houston. For nearly 40 years, Rebuilding Together Houston has been the only organization in our region to provide hundreds of families annually with non-disaster home repairs. This work adds 10 to 20 years to the life of a home, making the home safe, livable, and more resilient against disaster. Rebuild Together enlists community volunteers and licensed contractors to repair the homes of low-income, elderly, U.S. military veterans, homeowners with disabilities, and working families in need. You can learn more at rebuildinghouston.org. And as always, 25% of our offering will go to Interfaith Ministries Meals on Wheels, Feeding Houston Seniors. We have three ways you can give. You can text the number on the screen, go to our webpage for online giving, or if you prefer to mail a check, yes, we are still checking the mail at church.
labyrinths, which are symbolic pilgrimages, can be engaged in many ways. People might walk or roll through large labyrinths or trace their fingers or a small stone across small labyrinths. During this morning's meditation, I invite you to imagine yourself in a beautiful stone labyrinth near the ocean. The weather is pleasantly warm. The breeze is soft. The air is salty and the waves are gently rolling across the sand. As you prepare to enter the labyrinth, take a moment to find a comfortable place to relax. Take a deep breath in. And then another. As together we enter into a time of meditation followed by silence. Walk the maze within your heart. Guide your steps into its questioning curves. This labyrinth is a puzzle leading you deeper into your own truth. Listen in the twists and turns. Listen in the openness within all searching. Listen, a wisdom within you calls to a wisdom beyond you. And in that dialogue lies peace. Let us enter together into the silence. Amen and blessed be. This reading refers to a trip to the Jeffers Petroglyphs, glyphs, petroglyphs, sorry, um, in Minnesota, which are between seven and nine thousand years old. I remove my shoes because this is hallowed ground, the guide says, a holy place, not an everyday life place. The guide tells us how we know or think we know it was the one and not the other for those people millennia ago. But aren't the places where we live holy ground? Don't our very acts of feeding one another healing one another, singing to one another, teaching one another, dancing together and weeping together, hallow the places where we live. This is an early morning image, the guide says, spritzing it with water so we can see it on a cloudy afternoon. 
Shifting light through the hours and the seasons reveals different images. Isn't that the way it is with the images of our lives? That the signs and symbols, events and turning points and decisions, telling the stories of our days and years come into clarity and fade again through cycles of light and dark, seasons of birth and growth, hibernation and death. The stone is hard, the guide says, harder even than granite, so hard that the snows and rains and winds of thousands of years have not erased marks left by the glaciers of the last ice age. Yet the buffalo wore one tall rock smooth, rubbing away their irritations against it till it shone like glass. Isn't even this the way of our lives? That flesh and blood can find relief in rough places? That irritants can polish us? That hard will sometimes yield to soft after countless repeated encounters? Here ends the reading. This summer, I went on a pilgrimage. For a long time, I had been yearning to go back home. And by home, I met the place where I had grown up, where my parents had spent most of their lives, the place where my father's parents had migrated to when he was a young boy, the, fact, the place where my mother's parents had settled down to raise their family the place where my grandfather grew up, the place where my grandfather's father had helped to build houses before mysteriously disappearing when my grandfather was a young boy, the place where I was known as my grandfather's child, the high school biology teacher and football coach, the place where I had roots. Pilgrimages are, in their essence, spiritual journeys. 
people go on pilgrimages in many ways and to many places. Some are literal journeys to another place. Others are undertaken metaphorically and engage the interior life. Jews go to the Western Wall, the remaining wall of the Second Temple in Jerusalem, and leave prayers written on bits of paper and tucked into the crevices of wall. Christians retrace the path of Jesus to his crucifixion and death. Muslims fulfill one of the pillars of Islam by going on a Hajj to Mecca and circumnavigating the Kaaba, the house of God, first built by Abraham and his son Ishmael. Buddhists journey to India to venerate the Mahabodhi tree, a descendant of the tree under which the Buddha attained enlightenment. And Unitarian Universalists go east to the Boston region to walk along Beacon Street, worship at Arlington Street Church, gaze upon the statue of William Ellery Channing, meander through Mount Auburn Cemetery, seeking out the grave of Channing and John Murray and Margaret Fuller and so many others, and wander along Walden Ponds. And Unitarian Universalists go even farther east to Transylvania in modern day Romania, land of the only Unitarian king in history, and seek out the memorial to Ferenc David who successfully argued for freedom of religion for the Unitarians and was later imprisoned for life and thus martyred when he refused to invoke the name of Jesus in prayer, instead insisting that prayer be invoked only to God. My pilgrimage, my spiritual journey, took me both north and east to the land of Connecticut as I crossed the border, I traveled along roadways both familiar and strange. The trees were greener, lusher, and more plentiful than I remembered, and the hills were hillier. As I traveled familiar streets, I retraced the steps of my childhood and younger adult life. I reflected upon the ways the landscape shaped me. I grew up walking and sometimes biking almost everywhere. The homes of my grandparents, aunt and uncle and cousins, and my great aunt were all in walking distance. I walked to school, to my friends' houses, to Girl Scout meetings and choir rehearsals at church, to the library and corner store, in parades and along my paper route. I knew the public paths and stairs that cut across the hills and made walking a shorter distance than driving. I realized that my small world had been mine to explore through knowledge, music, religion, and nature. I had devoted time here. I knew the land and its people. I knew the language and its culture. And I realized that I am still exploring, that my call to enter a ministry has deep roots, that I love to come into a community and come to understand its people and language and culture in a deeper way over a period of a couple years, much deeper than a tourist might in a week or two. And I realized that I now have homes and friends in many places, not just one. Like Isaac, on this pilgrimage, I had set out to find treasure in a far off land, only to discover I had it with me all along, close to home, not in a physical home, but in the home of my heart and mind, with all the friends and family and faith communities I hold there in the love and memories I have for them and share with them. Pilgrims undertaking a pilgrimage, a spiritual journey, are seekers, seekers of many things, wisdom, 
miracles, inner transformation, peace, mystical experiences, healing, salvation. Isaac, the man from this morning story, was seeking salvation from poverty. The story could be understood as poverty of material resources or a poverty of the spirit and the associated lesson, one of social justice or spiritual growth. Pilgrim set out with intentionality, moving towards something bigger than themselves, whether that is God, the divine, the holy, the sacred, or that which is eternal. Pilgrims are humanists and theists, atheists and agnostics and pagans. They are Unitarian Universalists and their spiritual journeys often take the shape of traveling through the past in some way. Pilgrims, however, are not Taurus. Frank Fahey articulates eight elements that distinguish a pilgrim for a, from a tourist. Keep in mind that these elements can and should be interpreted broadly and are appropriate to universe, Unitarian Universalist theologies and philosophies, even when and if the symbolic language feels a bit foreign. The first element is faith. He says that there is always some kind of faith expectancy. Expectancy. The second is penance. The pilgrim is searching for wholeness. The third is community, which is often solitary, but can be open to all. The fourth is sacred space. By this, he means that silence is required to form an internal sacred space. Remember that pilgrimages can be either a physical journey or a solely internal journey. The fifth is ritual, which externalizes the change within. The sixth is a votive offering. This is a leaving behind a part of oneself a letting go in search of a better life. The seventh is a celebration, a celebrating to remember something akin to a victory over self. The eighth is perseverance. The pilgrim makes a commitment, realizing the pilgrimage is never really over. The heart of my pilgrimage came with a visit to my church. The Congregational Church of Naugatuck, Connecticut. This is the place where I was baptized and confirmed, where I learned to doubt and question and explore my faith, where I learned to love worship and value freedom of religion where I celebrated the lives of my brother and my father, and where, ironically enough, I learned about the Unitarians. Because of COVID, I was not able to go inside, but I did wind my way around the outside, experiencing a flood of memories. The large front door is wide open on a beautiful spring day. The church bells ringing out robing in the choir room, experiencing the joy of the processional, singing, holy, 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 and joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Recessing to Sunday school classes, pancake breakfasts, and Girl Scout meetings, confirmation classes and handbell rehearsals, and polishing the silver. In many ways, I was formed here this is the place where I first imagined becoming a minister when I was a small child sitting in the pew. In many ways, I was formed here. Church was an integral part of my upbringing and my life. 
These many years later, I now serve our faith as an interim minister, traveling the country from place to place, endeavoring to support our UU congregations in growing stronger and healthier. Much of this ministry involves helping a congregation explore its past to, to discover who it is now and why that is, and to support its growth into a new future and oftentimes a new identity. It is a pilgrimage of sorts that we take together, bound in this time and space of transition and potential transformation. As we continue to explore the past, there will be surprises. You might discover that some things were different from how you remembered, that other things have remained the same, though you never realized the pattern before. If we do it well, you as a congregation will be transformed. You will choose to carry parts of your tradition, parts of your history with you and leave others behind. You will journey forward in a new way, still the same congregation, yet forever changed, much like Whoopi Goldberg will demonstrate in this morning's postlude Though you know not yet its contents, like Isaac in our story, you will discover your treasure right here at home. My pilgrimage ended, and by that I mean my physical pilgrimage, with a viewing of the cross. I grew up under the shadow of a giant cross up on top of a hill which lit up at night and could be seen for miles around. It sits at a place called Holy Land, spelled out in giant white letters along the side of the hill, just like the famous Hollywood sign. It is closed now, though the cross still looms tall. It was run by Catholic nuns, and I visited it once as a child after begging my parents to see it though with careful discussions about the distinctions between my faith and theirs. A pilgrimage story, perhaps, for another time. In viewing the cross, I came to realize a remarkable consistency to my life, that I have always been on a path of moving toward the holy. I let go of a longing to return, to retrace my steps, and embraced a new sense of peace and wholeness. As Frank Fahey says, a pilgrimage is never really over. And so I found out when I returned to my mom's current home and she asked me to go through some old boxes with her. There we found a Mother's Day card I had given her when I was only nine years old. Here it is. Maybe it should be coming. All right. Uh oh, we're having trouble with the slides. Okay, so I'll just tell you what it says. Most famous mothers with a crayon drawing of a flower. And inside the card, it says, Mary, mother of Jesus, chosen by God 